very good evening, everyone. In this session of the G interview, I would like to introduce to you a very special guest joining us all the way from London, Mr. Ahmed Abudu. Mr. Abudu is an associate fellow with the Chatham House Middle East and North Africa program. His research focuses on China's rising influence in the MENA region, uh, Gulf geopolitics, the US-China competition, and its implications worldwide. Uh, he is also a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington and currently heads the China Studies Research Unit at the Emirates Policy Center. Uh, welcome, sir. We are glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Anusha, for having me. To give our viewers a very concise summary of this interview, sir, let's start with a very basic question. So before we dive into the specifics, how do you currently assess the security conditions in the Middle East and how, according to you, have they evolved since the Cold War era? Well, I think we are living in a volatile security system uh, at the moment in, in the Middle East. And this um, started from the end of the Cold War. Um, we can, from the end, the end of the Cold War until now, we can divide the security system and how it evolved into three main periods. The first one is just after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s. And this period can be described as full of divisions um, on the back of the Iraq invasion of Kuwait and the Oslo Accords between the Palestinians and, and Israelis. But in the end, it had some sort of general stability. And, you know, with competition, we had some form of uh, regional order, what I like to call it um, regionalization without regionalism. That is um, a regional order taking shape without integration between the main actors in this order. The other dimension was that the United States was turning into the security guarantor of, secure, of, of the regional order. And after the Iraq war, as you probably know, the, the, the US troops started to be permanently positioned and deployed in the Gulf in some military bases to make sure that the United States could, could protect the free flow of oil and energy and, and goods. After after this period, we we saw the U.S. invasion of Iraq in two thousand three, and before that, Afghanistan. And I think this character this period was characterized by some main elements. The first one is the rise of Iran as a revisionist player in the regional order, uh, more than any any time before and the intensification of terrorism all over the region. And I, I, I always, you know, I'm always bewildered by, after 9-11, how the United States wanted to tackle to terrorism, which it was a victim of, but in the process caused the intensification of terrorism, whether that is in Yemen or Iraq or Sinai or in other places all over the region. Um, but after that, I think the really... Uh, turning point was the Arab Spring in 2011. And since then, we entered a period of volatility uh, in the regional system where we have less security, less stability and more chaos and more wars and more terrorism and more, um, and this is very important, uh, uh, the influence of non-state actors uh, in the region. The other dimension during this period is the rise of great power competition. And we have seen Russia and China wanting to play a major role in defining this uh, new, the contours of the regional order. And the United States pivoting to Asia to focus on containing the rise of China and reducing its security commitments to, to the Middle East. And in the past three years, I think, the 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 main powers in the regional order wanted to create a new one based on economic and trade integration, infrastructure, connectivity, normalization of relations and multilateralism. But I think the war in Gaza proved this is very difficult if there is what I call coalition of losers who are left out of this new arrangement. 
Re- rightly said, sir, I would agree. And I think talking about lessening the security and having more wars due to this competition, I would like to bring up a burning issue here that is of the Israel-Palestine conflict. This conflict is a top priority at this point. So what do you think are the security implications of this conflict in the Middle East and in the world's perspective? And are there any potential diplomatic paths that you see or any innovative approaches that you feel can be used in order to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict? Let me start by the second part of your question, if I may. Sure. I think it is very difficult to think about a political settlement at the moment because of the following reasons. The first one is the announced objectives of the Israeli uh, ground operation in Gaza are elusive and very difficult to achieve. And I do not think they are realistic or they will get to the point of completely wiping out Hamas. This is undoable and American allies of of Israel made that very clear that they have to lower the level of their ambitions in Gaza. Uh, The second one, the killing of Palestinian civilians in Gaza will leave a scar, a long term one, and will intensify hatred all over the Middle East for years to come. This is an inflection point. It will stay with us for some time to come. Uh, and I, I I think this will have implications uh, all over the Middle East. On the other hand, in the West Bank, I think the two leader, the two leadership in Israel and the Palestinian leadership have a deficit of legitimacy and credibility on the Israeli side because they failed to stop the October 7 attack, on the Palestinian side because of corruption, incompetence and disunity in the Palestinian leadership. And particularly the Israeli government, this one is, as President Biden said last night, the most extreme government in the history of Israel. They are not interested in in peace. They are not interested in restarting any kind of process that will lead to a state two state solution. The, The solution that everybody in the Middle East is interested in, whether or not that is realistic anymore, this is another matter, but any kind of deal that would allow the Palestinians and Israelis to live side by side in peace in the future. I think this will require change in the leadership on on both sides to be able to come with innovative approaches um, towards peace that is within the the occupied territory. Outside, or if we zoom out um, on the region, I think it will not, as long as it doesn't turn into a regional war, And until now, we don't see any signs that Iran or Hezbollah or other Iran's proxies, such as the Houthis or or the Shia militias in Iraq, are interested in turning this conflict into a regional war. Until this is the case, I do not see this war causing a dramatic shift away from the United States being the hegemon, being the main security provider in the region in the long term. But what I see is the worst deal that any great power can get, which is more involvement in the region, but less credibility and less popularity. The perceptions in the Arab streets, especially, and of course, Iran and Turkey as well, um, is one towards the United States is one of double standards is one that Middle Easterns are being treated less than, for for example, Ukrainians, and that the United States will never be a fully 100% trusted partner. And I think this will have implications. The first one is the major actors in the region will accelerate the hedging strategies towards Russia and China. They They will still think and seek Um, security assurances from the United States, but on the economy and technology and multipolarity in the region and multilateralism as well, they will want to have more ties with these powers away from the West. Um, I think also that what the Houthis are doing now in the Red Sea will raise concerns in the long term on the freedom of shipping, for everyone in the region or outside the region. In the the bigger picture all over the world, I think the Palestinian 
COS will have more support all over the world, including in Europe and the United States. And I think what happened on October 7 will be seen in the future as an inflection point that changed how the Palestinians are seen outside and how the sympathy towards their cause is, especially in Western countries. Of course, sir. and I think when you talk about U.S. being an untrustworthy power, it is to some extent very justified for these countries to not trust that hegemon anymore. And with U.S. going out of the picture, I think not Russia, but we have China coming into the picture right now. Uh, as the head of the China Studies Unit at the Emirates Policy Center, you likely engage deeply with the nuances of China's relations in the Middle East and North Africa region. How do you see China's interests and influences in this region? And I think it does, but just to frame the question, do its objectives align or do they clash with the interest of other global powers, uh, not to mention especially and particularly the U.S.? I wouldn't say the United States would be out of the picture. The United States will not be out of the picture because the United States does not want to leave the Middle East. And Middle Eastern countries, especially Gulf uh, countries, do not want to see the United States leaving. But I agree with you that China will have more role to play in the Middle East in the future. And on this particular conflict, I think... um, In the strategic ends, the United States and China align. They both want to see a peaceful, um, a a peace process uh, restarted again. They they both want to see a resolution uh, to the conflict between the Palestinians and Israelis, a long term and permanent one. But tactically, I think China does not agree with what the United States is doing now, which is from the war unequivocally supporting Israel. China has a policy of pro-Palestinian cause since Mao Zedong, and um, they, it was very interesting to see the Chinese leadership avoiding mentioning Hamas or condemning its killing of civilians inside, inside Israel, which was horrific and heinous thing to do, but the Chinese do not want to, to, to be uh, at odds with the Palestinians. Um, I think they, I call this um, anti-Western neutrality, which is uh, posing neutrality in public, but at the same time, pressuring the Western position on the war. And we have seen China using its rotating presidency of the UN Security Council to um, align its views more with the Arab and Muslim uh, world against the United States and Europe. Um, At the same time, China expects the support of these countries uh, to its policies in Taiwan, Xinjiang, and Hong Kong and Tibet. It also wants the support of these countries in uh, international organizations like the the United Nations. But also, this is crucial time for China in the region because it comes as President Xi Jinping rolls out his own vision for global governance that is in the global security initiative global development initiative and global civilization initiative and the principles underpinning these initiatives um, are very um, seen as suitable for a place like the middle east and the middle east as a fertile soil for these principles to be received positively at the same time the the war or the China position on the war proved that Israel ranks low on China's priorities in in the Middle East. And this is understandable because not only China um, historically supports the Palestinians, but also Israel is one country in the end. Uh, And China now with the de-risking language coming from the West and the tick war from the United States, especially Chinese leadership Uh, understood that they have lost any hope in the future, in the long term, for the West to change its hostility towards China from their perspective. And China now is positioning itself to be the leader of Global South, competing with countries like India. So I think for them, the most important audience in the long term is the Global South 
audience, which in the majority of it supports the Palestinians over Israel. I see. So just a follow up question, considering that China and USA both are somehow in the picture in the Middle East security arena. Um, how would this Israel-Palestine conflict and the Russia-Ukraine war, how do you think the UAE and Saudi Arabia have changed their approach, if they have, towards both US and China, towards approaching them diplomatically and in the security realm? I think the two, this is a very important question because, you know, it touches on a very important trend that is, uh, that is, that's been happening since 2021. Um, I think we have to look back, if we're talking about Saudi Arabia and the UAE, to 2019, when Saudi Arabia was attacked for the first time uh, by missiles coming from Iran and attacking uh, Aramco installations in Saudi Arabia and wiping out 50% of oil pro uh, production in Saudi Arabia. Later on in 2022, the same happened with the UAE. The Houthis attacked Abu Dhabi, uh, which both of incidents didn't see the United States coming to the rescue. All right. So this was an, an, an uh, a turning point in, in the commitment of Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE. Uh, and starting from this, they realized that the United the United States is not is no longer the trusted partner that will defend them militarily against this hot kind of hostility. So since then, they started to diversify their relationships to bringing in more external powers into the Middle East, mainly Russia and China. The war in Ukraine accelerated this trend. And I think the war in Gaza will do more damage to the United States' moral and security standing in the region. And it will also accelerate the region's trajectory towards multiple, multipolarity. I think also that when it comes to security, these countries, and I have to mention that, these countries still see the United States as the most powerful uh, guarantor of security in the Middle East and do, do, don't do want this to change. But in the end, when it comes to uh, diversifying their economic ties, this is linked to their economic transformation to reduce their reliance on oil, uh, which is enshrined in Vision 2030 in the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, for example. So I think China and Russia will play a very important role on the other hand, Russia, after Ukraine war, uh, uh, shifted away from their European classic partners in energy, and a huge transformation happened in the global energy uh, map um, towards more uh, sending Russia's oil to, to China and towards the Gulf states playing a very important role in the arrangement of OPEC plus with Russia. Uh, I think they will continue to play a very important role in maintaining stability in energy sector throughout the region, especially after the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Iran joined BRICS, um, will join BRICS in January officially. And if you look at BRICS, you will see that it has the main producers, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Russia, but also the, the main buyers, India and China. So these countries together in a multilateral sitting will play a very important role in maintaining the stability of energy sector. And this should be seen as one of the repercussions of Ukraine and Gaza wars. All right, that is a very fresh perspective on something related to BRICS. You know, with more countries joining it, we see a more multilateral role going in. But staring a little apart from that and going to a realm that is called the fourth pillar of democracy, that is media. I believe that both US and China have their various propaganda scenes and media affects their internal and external policies to a large extent. And I bet the same happens in countries like India and the countries in the Middle East. So media often has played a crucial role in shaping the state's approach and the people's approach towards how uh, they conceive a war or what their perspective towards a particular security issue is. So I would, uh, 
if you'd like to set, shed some light on the challenges and the biases in media coverage surrounding the conflicts within Middle East and Gaza, and do these affect the international communities or uh, the UN's per se approach? And if yes, then how? I think we have seen great bias uh, in the beginning of the war, especially in Western media. Uh, and that was understandable uh, partially because of the gruesome images coming out of the Hamas attack on October 7. But that is not a justification. What happened is was a shock. Uh, these, especially Western um, me main media, uh, has been always seen as um, impartial and have some credibility and accountability. Uh, but I think what happened after the October 7 attack changed this perception in many places in, in the world, especially in the Middle East. Now people trust these media big guns less than before. And although we have seen a change back to some kind of impartiality in the coverage, uh, especially with the massacres that are happening now in the Gaza Strip, by Israel against Palestinian civilians, I think still that was also an inflection point in perception towards the media. On the other hand, in China, I think, as you know, China is an authoritarian country and media there doesn't have a choice, right, but to toe the line of the government. And we have seen that the main uh, me um, media in, in China has been echoing messaging coming from uh, the leadership of the Communist Party and the state about the state's position on the Gaza war. I think, of course, as you said, media plays a very important role in shaping people's uh, perceptions. But I think in this war, what happened is the people played a very important role in shaping the coverage of the media. Because if you look at the massive numbers of people that have been demonstrating against the war and uh, asking for a ceasefire in the main Western capitals, including London, I think this put huge pressure, not only on the governments, but also on the media coverage, which didn't have a choice but to amend this and be more or, or less biased than before. I think the anger that the media professionals received from the street especially their own local people, uh, played a very important role in trying to look at the conflict from uh, a more professional approach. Before that, they did, that didn't exist. I think also that what, what, what President Biden said last night about Israel losing any sympathy and having to Netanyahu having to to change his extremist government, I think that was also partially the work of the media, because when the media echoes the street, governments become under huge pressure to change their rhetoric. And I think as um, for for as long as the war goes, I think we will see this change happening towards the right direction and more and more pressure happening on politicians. Um, to do the right thing. Of course, sir. and by saying that doing the right thing, this makes me think about the recent news that India voted towards a ceasefire in Gaza. And I wonder if having a general assembly uh, talk about whether they should force a ceasefire upon Israel and in the Gaza, is UN doing enough? Are these multilateral uh, organizations doing enough to stop war? And if not, can they perform a more efficient role in doing so? I don't think they're doing enough. I think the war in Gaza proved, and before that, the war in Ukraine as well, uh, proved that uh, bodies like the UN Security Council uh, is completely paralyzed and uh, hijacked by uh, the, VAT, the five V to big powers. And I think India has uh, great legitimacy and asking to reform that and to change that. Because you know what we are seeing now is the very institutions that humanity came together to uh, establish them as um, a constitutional buffer zone between the worst instincts of human beings not working anymore and eroding. 
and subsequently their legit legitimacy in the street all over the world is is er eroding as well uh, i think also that we are we are seeing the the call that india has been putting out for so long now being echoed all over the world we have seen arab countries uh, expressing less faith in the competence of these uh, multilateral institutions and uh, backing India in calling uh, for them to be reformed, to represent more what the people want and what their government uh, governments want, and to actually listen this hegemony by the five big powers in the Security Council, that when they disagree, um, like in a war like, like Gaza, we see the worst performance ever of these institutions. So if you had a log of the timeline since the war started and all the vetoes uh, that have been used either by China, Russia or by the United States, I think this gives you a clear picture on what needs to be done, which I called earlier the right thing, which is a complete and permanent ceasefire in this context. But but generally and broad, more broadly, a huge reform endeavor of these multilateral institutions. So, sir, uh, you have a very unique perspective on this issue in the Middle East and on conflicts that arise in North Africa. Your first-hand experience, I think, with the 2011 Tahrir Square uprising in Cairo it has done a lot to shape your uh, opinions and your research around the same. Would you like to share any specific anecdotes or moments that left a lasting impression on your memory of the uprising? Yes, um, I think that was a historic moment uh, for me because I'm also Egyptian. And uh, it was, as, as you imagine, people jumping up and down, screaming, and it was a state of euphoria in Tahrir Square and all over the country. But the moment that I will never forget and will always stay with me is my dad, who is now 73 years old, um, breaking down in tears after the military announced that the President Hosni Mubarak, after more than 30 years in power, is stepping down. And, you know, my dad is a tough man and ex-Special Forces man who fought two wars before and so very difficult things and horrible things in his life. And he doesn't cry easily, you know? And, and for me, this was a very touching personal experience of that. But in research, I think um, later I knew that this is a historic moment for the region as well, because, you know, Egypt has this unique influence, not necessarily uh, any more geopolitical influence only, but but also the soft power influence all over the region. And I think this will have reverberations uh, all over the region, which happened actually later in, in Syria and, and Yemen and Libya and, and other places as well. So uh, I think that was a turning point uh, for me personally. And and for me also, it was a turning point in my, in my career. Uh, I started to see geopolitics is my as my future uh, career, and since then, from before that, from two thousand eight, I'm doing this. But since then, that was my focus um, in life. It's amazing, sir. I think we have one of the most uh, insightful discussions today, and one of the most, you know, very um, what do you call it? A very exciting interview, which I think will make our viewers think about these issues and probably what they're going to do in life. So uh, coming towards the end of this interview, a lot of people watching us uh, want to become researchers or are interested in the field of geopolitics and international relations. And since you're working in the same field, I think it would be safe to end with a last question about any advice that you would like to give to our viewers, most of whom are young people covering colleges and currently finishing their master's degrees. So any advice that you'd have for them? Well, if you are planning to go into this field, it's not easy. And I'm not trying to put you off, uh, but it is not easy because, first of all, it's very, very competitive, but not this is not everything. It needs a lot of focus. This should be your life. 
uh, day and night. You, if you want to be a researcher, that automatically means you have to think about what you do and your the thing you focus on day and night, 24 hours. This is the negative part of the job. But the positive part, it's the most enjoyable thing you can do in your life, especially if you are into geopolitics, security, and research in general. Because, because you like this um, and you chose to study it, I think you will enjoy it the most in your life going forward in the next 50 years. So I strongly encourage you to pursue a career in this field if you are up to the task. And up to the task means you have to be always updated. You have to be always ready to come up with fresh takes uh, and, and on things, but most importantly, they have to be organic and they have to be your uh, takes. They have to express who you are and the way you see things. But also, uh, I think you, you also have to study. You have to study for the rest of your life. And I'm not here talking about taking a master degree or a PhD. This is the PhD for life you will be doing a constant and permanent PhD until your last day on this earth. So if you are ready for that, if you have what it takes, go ahead, you will do great in this field. Thank you so much, sir. I think those words mean a lot to me personally, considering that I'm thinking of going the same line. So obviously life is a learning process and I guess let's never, I never hope to stop doing that. So thank you so much for taking this time out for us, for the Geostrata and my team and me are really happy with this interview and we look forward to having you here again. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anusha. I wish you uh, great luck uh, in this field and to become a very renowned and famous colleague one day. And I will be very happy to be on the show again soon.